Welcome everybody to the webinar. I can see people are just clicking in, so we're just going to wait a few minutes while people are logging in. It's uh, shooting up quite quickly. Well, while we're waiting, oh yeah, we're going up by about uh, 20 or 30 people uh, every few seconds. Um, I'm just going to tell you a bit about some other themes on the Practitioner Hub uh, while we wait to kick off our topic today on nutrition. Um, nutrition and inclusive business was our topic actually in December when we sent out a, a monthly theme on nutrition. This month we're going to be looking at how businesses and donors can work together, which of course is quite relevant to nutrition because there's lots of public-private sector partnerships. Next month we're going to be looking at consumer insight and how valuable it is for inclusive business. And uh, last year where we had 12 themes, there being 12 months, but you might be particularly interested in themes on uh, how to go to scale, the challenges of scale for inclusive business, and a whole theme on partnership. Uh, so although this webinar is part of last month's theme on nutrition, there are many other themes that might interest this kind of audience. Um, we are about to start. Yes, click-ins are just beginning to slow down. I think people have found their way into Zoom. Thank you for those of you who are new to Zoom for finding your way in. Okay, right, so welcome to our conversation today. This is the second webinar in a series of two on nutrition at the base of the pyramid. And we're going to look today at about delivery and distribution channels. What, which channels are effective for reaching consumers with impact and for underpinning business viability? Our first webinar last week, uh, Marty took us, Marty from Gain, who I'll introduce in just a second, took us through um, a series of really important issues about creating demand and awareness for usage and repeat adoption for impact of nutritious foods. Today, uh, Lucy from Hystra is going to take us through the uh, distribution, the supply side. So we have a fantastic panel as usual. Lucy Klasfeld mcgrath is going to lead the presentation today. She's a senior project manager, project manager at Hystra and is their expert on BOP marketing and just last mile distribution. Marty Van Leeren is the Director of Maternal, Infant and Young Child Nutrition at GAIN, and as I said, she led our presentation last week. And we have an excellent panellist to contribute to the presentation today in Clemence Martineau, who's Nutrition Projects Manager at GRET. We'll hear more about GRET in one second. And she's been a marketing expert there since 2010. So thank you all three of you for joining today. I'm Caroline Ashley, I'm the editor of the Practitioner Hub for Inclusive Business, which is an online platform all about implementation of inclusive business models at the base of the pyramid. So we need to know a little bit about you, and this webinar is going to be interactive, as they usually are. So first we have a poll for you. And our first question to find out more about you is, did you attend last week's webinar? Uh, you just need, you should be able to see the quick poll on the screen in front of you. Please click yes or click no. This is the easy poll. There are going to be some more difficult questions from Lucy as we get going. Uh, please click. I'll give a five second countdown and then we'll see the results. So five, four, three, two, one. Thank you for voting. Let's see the results. Okay, so just over half were here last week, just under half were not. Thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, so one of the rules is please participate in the polls. The other few rules are you can type in your question in the chat function uh, at any time. You can choose to send it just to panelists if you particularly want something private, but I think it's best to send your question to, to, to quote everyone so that others can see it at the same time, if that's okay with you. Um, we will send you an email afterwards asking for feedback. Please return it to us and join the discussion on Twitter at any time. Finally, you don't need to ask whether the slides are available, uh, because yes, they are, yes, they will be, and so will the webinar recording. Here is the link, it's at the end of the presentation, it will be in the email you receive afterwards. So yes, you will definitely have the slides. Uh, now with that said, I'll ask our panelists to quickly introduce their organizations, and then we'll move on to the presentation. Bearing in mind, half of you heard this last week, so we'll be a bit quicker uh, this week. Lucy, tell us about Hystra. 
Hi. Um, so Hystra is a global consulting firm specialized in inclusive businesses and based on the pyramid markets, as you can see. Uh, we do what you can see on the image, basically trying to bridge the gap between big corporate offices and the uh, base of the pyramid environments, uh, trying to create strategies for big corporates and also for foundations, etc., to have a real impact at the base of the pyramid through business strategies. And I'll mm -hmm. hand over to Marty. Thanks, yeah. Hi. Um, so I work at GAIN, the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. Um, we are an international organization, but also a Swiss foundation, launched at the UN in 2002. We're a young organization. We are driven by a world without malnutrition, um, and we are specifically focusing on access to nutritious and safe foods um, for everybody, basically, but specifically for small children, for girls, and for women. There's three thematic, er thematic areas, and the pictures are kind of highlighting that. One of our programs addresses large-scale food fortification. Um, the program I'm responsible for is about nutrition for women and children. And then we have a third uh, thematic area, which is addressing agriculture and nutrition. We work a lot with businesses. Um, I think that's one of the specific um, characteristics of GAIN, that we're not only looking at the public sector, but also the private sector. Over to Clemence. Hi, so I'm currently working at GRET. So GRET is a professional for fair development NGO uh, that has been fighting poverty and inequalities since 1976. Um, we act actually on a range of seven complementary themes, but one of which is uh, health, nutrition and social protection. For more than 20 years now, we are experiencing uh, some specific uh, um, projects in maternal and child health. So our vision is to work on long-term prevention of malnutrition by improving feeding hygiene and health care practices, mainly with women in childbearing age, at childbearing age, sorry, and children under the age of two. So actually our pillars of intervention in the countries, so we are developing projects directly on the field. Um, it's mainly a provision of appropriate fortified food produced locally with the local private sector. Uh, the second pillar is about awareness raising uh, on appropriate practices in terms of feeding, maternal and child health care, and also family planning. Uh, we are working as well on improvement of the quality of health services and the development of social health protection systems and nutrition-oriented safety nets. Thank you very much. And now at this point, I'd like to land, hand over to Lucy to run us through the presentation on marketing. And uh, Marty and Clemence will be coming in with uh, additional comments as we go through and type your questions in chat at any time. Lucy, thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, so we're going to be talking today about the broad topic of marketing nutrition for the base of the pyramid, um, more specifically about distribution. Uh, what we'll, I will be presenting comes from a report we prepared for GAIN uh, back in 2014. Um, and we, I mean, its particularity that we didn't try to reinvent the wheel, but we really tried to learn from existing case studies, hence the title, Key Lesson from Case Studies. Uh, more specifically, the methodology we used was to uh, interview experts, review articles, uh, and in addition, conduct seven in-depth case studies of companies or NGOs working with a business model in the space of infant nutrition uh, or uh, young children food in the case of milk uh, and uh, water in the case of Nandi because they had particularly insightful methodologies um, in terms of uh, triggering compliance or marketing tools. So we thought they would be very interesting as well to learn what could work in marketing and distribution, distributing um, good food, nutritious food, uh, in particular for infants. Um, so this plus, uh, I should say, we also used experience from uh, past assignments we did looking at over 20 micro distribution uh, companies selling different uh, fast moving consumer goods in, in 20 different countries. So all this uh, led us to prepare or to land on eight key lessons learned. Um, the first four were discussed by Marty last week. Uh, mostly on the value proposition and the marketing and compliance side. And today we're going to be speaking about the distribution side and the sustainability side. We don't have the time for the eighth one, but I'll invite you to go and have a look at the report if you want to learn more. And without further ado, let's get into the topic. Um, one uh, little uh, nota bene, if I can say, why is it so important to have product availability? 
uh, it's important, well, for the economic viability of the company to make sure basically they're selling the product in their shops. If the products are not available, then obviously <laughs> you don't get sales. But it's important to have that constant product availability also because it's the only way to have compliance in people using the product, consuming the product. Because consuming a nutritious food once in a while won't get the effect and the impact we're looking for. Uh, so it's really important to have this compliance in order to have the social impact and the health impact we're talking about, not just in terms of the economic viability of the companies or organizations we're looking at. So before I get into the first lesson we're going to discuss today, I'd like to have your thoughts um, on selling nutritious foods at the base of the pyramid. So you should see the poll uh, arriving uh, in front of you. The question here is, do you think selling nutritious foods at the base of the pyramid cannot be done via traditional retail as products need too much explaining or needs traditional retail to reach as many BOP clients as possible or requires a dedicated sales force and promoters to explain the product benefits? You can only click on one. So I'll let you vote and I'll give you five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, go. And we'll have the results. So nobody think it cannot be done via traditional retail, good. <laughs> and so uh, the majority of you thinks it requires a dedicated sales force and promoters to explain the product benefits. And just a little over the, the, uh, the half, sorry, uh, says it needs traditional retail to reach as many BOP clients as possible. Well, it's a very good mix, an interesting mix, because you can, it's actually indeed a mix of the two that you need. Um, you do need traditional retail to reach as many BOP clients as possible, but in addition to this channel, you need some way to create awareness and to market your products, as we'll see. Um, so, moving on. Indeed, what we have seen is that, at least in rural and mature markets, traditional retail is the most cost-efficient distribution channel. Uh, you can see here uh, a, a sales lady from PKL in Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, you can see the product she's selling on the left. And she goes to the mom and pop shops to, to restock them and make sure they always have the product in stocks. Um, so what do we mean when we talk about retail in this section? Um, informal retail are the small mom and pop shops you can see uh, illustrated in the picture here, which takes many different forms in many different countries. But it's basically a very small area, as you can see, typically a few square meters, uh, where you can find a lot of different things. So that's what we call traditional retail. Uh, now, what we call retail, um, in particular when we'll get into numbers, includes the whole value chain, so all the distribution players, from the wholesalers to the distributors to the shops themselves, uh, which can be mom and pop shop, modern train of pharmacies. So after this small vocabulary point, um, why, how do you... How can you push this product through retail? As many of you pointed out, they still require a lot of education. So the first uh, thing you need to do is to have a push of the product, meaning incentivizing retailers to take on the product on their shelves, because they're often new products, complicated products that they don't necessarily know, especially if they're from a local brand and not a big uh, premium imported brand. Um, so how do companies do this? Typically what we've seen, as you can see on the left graph here, is that BOP local companies must offer better margins to retailers than established companies. Uh, each bar here is the retailer's margin that one company was offering to their client. And you can see that the newer local companies typically, I mean, always offered better margins to the retailers than their competitors uh, or than typical products because they had no other choice. Otherwise, the retailers just wouldn't take them on their shelves. The other thing that successful companies were doing is that uh, they were building partnerships with not all the retailers, but with some retailers to make sure that these ones would really become promoters of the product. Because as many of you pointed out in the poll, these products are relatively complex and need a little bit of explaining and promotion. So choosing which retailers you're gonna work with and making sure you educate them a little bit about the product so that they become promoters of your product is very important. And to do this, uh, you can help with uh, some incentives like shelf display material, uh, which you can see here done in the case of Farinor in Côte d'Ivoire or in the case of Milkurat in Indonesia. 
uh, you must ensure that these shops have regular visits from your salespeople so that they don't have any stock out, as we've seen, not just for a matter of repeat sales, but also to ensure your client can get the product regularly so that it has the uh, health effect you're looking for. And also in terms of loyalty programs, for example, you can see here the, the uh, scorecards, if I can say that um, Milk Ad gives to their retailers. Every time they order from them, they can fill in a card and they can win various products from fridges uh, to shelf display materials, etc., which both make the uh, shop owner happy and also help their own promotion because they're all promotion materials, basically. Um, I think, Clémence, you had a comment on this? Yeah, actually, I think uh, one important point is about um, regarding the merchandising. So the fact that you can put your product um, on the good shelf display so that people can have uh, easily access to it, uh, which is a main point that is difficult to negotiate sometimes with the retailers because of the big competition of local big brands or sometimes supported products because of more budget or wider range of products. So the point was to say that uh, there, there must be a, there is a big bargaining power um, of biggest uh, brands to put their product on shelves. So it's a big important point to try to negotiate the product placement on the store, which is very important for the demand and for the consumer who enters the, the, the shop. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we've just mentioned here that the product, getting the product on the shelf of retailers requires push uh, on the retailer side. It also requires some pool, so basically making the retailer feel that there will be a demand for the product. Um, and so that pool can be created by two types of marketing. Uh, sorry for the jargon here. So below the line marketing, which is basically proximity marketing and above the line marketing, which is more mass media marketing. Um, the two types of marketing have different goals. Typically above the line uses mass media. It's more to raise awareness, make the product overall known um, while below the line marketing is more to educate because you spend more time directly with the clients it's really proximity marketing and it can also help trigger trial they both have their uh, pros and cons uh, in terms of pros so the uh, mass media the above the line marketing allows you to reach all value chain actors at once from the wholesalers to the clients that is really important because often um, we've seen that in developing countries, the retailers will say, I don't know your products. I've never heard about it. I don't see why I should take it on my shelves. While if they've seen it on a TV ad, it basically gives enough credibility to the brand that they'll accept to take it in. So you might not need a lot of these TV campaigns or radio campaigns, but a little bit of it is really necessary, not so much to convince your clients, but to convince your retailers. Uh, on the other hand, below the line marketing, um, well, first has the obvious advantage of reaching areas even that don't have TV. Um, so, well, where you don't have TV, that's pretty much the only option. Um, and it has the additional advantage that it allows immediate first try and feedback for little companies that don't have the money to pay for big, you know, pre-marketing campaigns, etc. Uh, having the opportunity to test the product with clients and see how they react to it, what they think of the taste, et cetera, can be a, a really key aspect of it as well. Um, and I mean, we don't really have a recommendation here in terms of you should use one or the other. What we've seen is that you should probably use both. The mix of how much you should use of each depends on the specific uh, specificities of the country how much people trust the media, which sometimes is not at all, so you shouldn't invest too much in, uh, in TV campaigns. Sometimes, on the contrary, it's really seen as uh, something aspirational if you've seen it on TV, um, and depending also on the reach of these media. Uh, in terms of cost, to give you an idea, we've seen that, broadly speaking, a one-week campaign of two broadcasts per day of a 30-second spot comes back to about the same cost as one to three full-time employee promoters working one year. So then you really have to decide where you want to use your marketing budget. So where does that take us? All these costs for push to incentivize your retailers and for pool to create the, to set up the right marketing so that retailers will take on the product and clients will buy. Basically, this creates a relatively high cost of marketing and distributing the products. So on this graph, we've represented as a percentage of the final price of the product. Uh, how much was spent by the various companies we studied in terms of um, distribution and marketing costs. And for the product uh, in our study, on average, 
<laughs> it's not even uh, the maximum. On average, it was 64%, which obviously is, is a lot. Uh, you only have 36% left to pay for the product, etc. cetera. Um, so how was this 64% spread? You can see that about 33% was just in the margin for the retailers and distributors, uh, then 17% to pay for the salespeople, and then 14% for the marketing, um, so below the line and above the line. Um, basically, the, the, the thing that people kind of made decisions on like like the managers of these companies the directors of these companies the last budget that they could squeeze was the above the line and below the line marketing uh, okay. aspect so they were really only spending if they had the cash to spend that's why um, the above the line budget is four percent like for typical fmcg or like for products that are sold at a larger scale because i mean this is 4% of, of a relatively small amount because these companies weren't, I mean, were selling relatively more than other companies in their space, but not so much compared to the big uh, brands, et cetera. Uh, and this budget really gets squeezed by how much cash is available at the end of the day. Um, Lucy, we, sorry to interrupt. Um, and, and don't want a big diversion, but we all know there are restrictions on what you can do in terms of above the line marketing on, on infant food. Could you just yeah. clarify that? And does that apply to below the line as well? We just had a question come in. The restrictions. So the, the code itself does, I mean, maybe I should let Marty answer that yeah, one. But. Maybe I was wondering if that was from last <laughs> question. Yeah, I saw the question, and uh, it's a really good question. I think um, the reference on the, the chat is to the International Code for Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes, which, um, which is basically um, applying to all foods that um, indeed can be used instead of breast milk. So it's more infant formula, follow-on milks, etc., and um, actually, um, it does not apply in exactly the same way to, um, let's say, the porridges that children will take after six months of age, because then they need and the breast milk and the porridges. So the, the strictness of the code, where you're not allowed to make, um, you are not allowed to uh, promote it um, in shops, um, um, above the line, um, there's no claims that you can put on. Um, applies mainly for the, the milk type products, if I could say so, and um, the restrictions are less strict for the products that are used next to breastfeeding um, for children 6 to 24 months. Um, if you really want to know all the details, um, look into the code, but more specifically, um, um, contact me afterwards. Gain has a paper written with the MRICN working group which is a maternal infant young child nutrition working group um, a couple of years ago where we tried to interpret the code on how it applies to um, the porridge type of things. Am I allowed another remark on this slide, Lucy? Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Okay, because what is interesting in this slide is that, you know, if people are looking at it and say, gee, um, the products, why are the products in the, in the study um, spend so much more money relatively than the typical fast moving consumer goods um, to, the re to the right of the slide, which are, let's say, the multinationals, the big companies. And of course, it's relative, right? So um, um, big multinationals have big turnovers and so um, sell a lot of products and have more profit and therefore, relatively, it's less, whereas maybe in absolute terms, it's more money that they spend. But, but there's a couple of reasons why small companies which are represented in this study pay more to retail because the turnover of their products is much slower than that of, let's say, big brands. And retailers do not want those products to sit on the shelf too long. So they make small companies pay relatively more than the, the bigger companies because products that are off their shelf and are being sold are just um, giving a better return to the retailers as well. So that is um, one point. Another point that is really important is then when we're talking about above the line, below the line, promotion, marketing, we're talking about nutritious foods here. And they need not only promotion on the brand and the product, but actually they need education on the nutrition elements of the product. That is something that, pro, that uh, the companies also do. 
And maybe they shouldn't do it. Maybe that should sit with public sector, but then public sector doesn't talk about products. So somehow these companies try to do two in one, education on nutrition and promotion of their brands. And that also um, brings them the cost a little bit. Yeah, yeah, very true. Um, so just to conclude on, on this slide, uh, you've, you can see we've extrapolated at scale the companies we had seen uh, and the cost of the companies we had seen in the study, which were all relatively small scale still. And we still estimated that even at scale, they wouldn't reach the uh, typical distribution uh, and, and marketing margins of the typical FMCG because you would still need all this additional education, et cetera. And you would probably still need as well a little bit bigger margins than for typical products like um, toilet paper or whatever that people already use, though toilet paper not in every location. <laughs> that might be a bad example, but let's say soap. Um, because these are still products that are uh, more complex and rotate, as Marty said, less quickly than other types of FMCG. Um, so anyway, an expensive business to be in. Continuing, uh, next poll. So this, um, now let's talk specifically about urban, urban markets. In urban markets, do you think that a direct sales force um, is an unnecessary expense as products can be sold through retail, as we just saw? Um, or can be cost effective at product launch to create demand or can be cost effective over the long run to maximize compliance. So I'll give you five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Let's look at the poll results. Um, yeah, you were shy on answering this one. There's a lot more of you out there. <laughs> well, maybe we didn't leave enough time. So uh, nobody thinks it's an unnecessary expense. That's very good because indeed uh, a local sales force can actually play both roles, be cost effective at product launch to create demand or be cost effective over the long run to maximize compliance. And we'll see some examples here that do both. So well done, everybody. <laughs> Uh, we've seen that indeed in urban markets, door-to-door -door can create demand and build client loyalty. The picture you can see here is a saleswoman from NutriZaza. Clemence will tell us more about this program of GRET afterwards. Well, it's now a social enterprise, but it was started as a GRET program, sorry. Um, and you can see her uh, walking through the slums of Antananarivo at breakfast time to bring warm porridge to young children there. Uh, a, at appropriate warm porridge with all the nutritious elements they need. Um, so we have basically seen two different types of direct sales force model work well. Um, the first one is uh, leveraging a pre-existing trusted network. Uh, so a network that's already selling other products and that will be only working part-time for the new product. So you're basically leveraging all the costs that have already been invested in creating that network. The problem being that these networks rarely exist. One such example is that of BRAC that GAIN is actually supporting. Um, BRAC is the largest NGO in the world, for those of you who don't know them. Uh, they reach about 110 million people worldwide. Um, and in particular, they're particularly big in Bangladesh, their home country, where they have uh, over 90,000 community health workers, including about half of them who are already selling other health products in communities, and they were leveraged to distribute MNPs, micronutrient powders, in addition to their other range of health products. And this is working very well with over, I think it's 14 million products sold per year, Marty, or these were the number in 2014, it might have increased even since. But basically, yeah, a, a really scaled program. Um, the other example, the other possibility where you don't have that existing network is to hire a specialized full-time sales force that will be really dedicated to market development and somehow should be distinct from physical delivery because the market development is basically promoting your product, educating the consumers to understand why these nutritious products are important in particular for porridge for, for complementary foods for children so that they get the nutritional requirements they need. Um, and basically these, um, so th this task of educating people is complicated, requires uh, relatively educated salespeople as well, or promoters as well, to explain all these benefits. Well, the simple task of physical delivery can be done 
by much more simple people as well and much less expensive people in terms of salaries as well. Um, so you can see here the example of Nutrizaz again. Um, I'll let Clémence tell us more about this program. Okay, so Anuchizaz is, a, as you said, you see a social enterprise now uh, in, Mal in Madagascar uh, that has been um, supported by Gret on some years and is still supported on a way in technical assistance, actually. And uh, Anuchizaz uh, made the challenges to distribute uh, high fortified foods for children from six months uh, in the very vulnerable areas, uh, urban areas of uh, Tananarib uh, first, and then in other um, big cities of Madagascar. Um, actually, um, what uh, Lucy wants to point out on this slide is maybe that Nutrizaz has two specific distribution, distribution channels. One on very classic sales rep team uh, dedicated 100% to retail, um, wh which is one point. The other one is what we call the animatrice, who are actually uh, these women uh, who are recruited inside the vulnerable areas. So they are women of the areas that know the people already, that have some influence, that can make and create awareness about the products on one side, but also education people about the good use uh, and the correct use of these products. Uh, so what they do is that they are selling door to door ready to eat porridge every day to the population. And at the same time, they are, they are making some nutrition education to make sure about the, the correct use of the product. Um, and actually, the recruitment process of these women is based uh, first on the, their competencies. So they are hired and they are trained uh, to get good education about on nutrition and specific, specifically, sorry, about complementary foods and um, breastfeeding. And actually, the, the process is also based on performances. So these women, they, they, are in, they integrate first a Malagasy Association to get training first and try to start business. And if they perform uh, correctly on the basis about which is three kilograms per day, they can get hired by the social enterprise Nutrizaz with a minimum wage. Uh, and then they can get bonus uh, as soon as they reach some uh, better, um, uh, better sales. So at the same way, um, Nutrizaz reinforce the competencies of these uh, saleswomen, but they also educate them and train them to make better awareness inside the areas. And on, in one way, these women, uh, this specific channel also um, is also a good a way to trigger demand and to um, make people be aware of the product and make them buy also the product inside the normal distribution channel, let's say the retail. Um, so that's the main point of the Nutrizaz. Uh, distribution. Thank you, Clemence. And I think so, something key there is that uh, in this case, the animatrices are actually both the, the, uh, doing the market development and at this stage doing the physical delivery because there is still relatively little awareness and understanding about the product benefits. So that at this stage, they still need to do both, but one can imagine that in the future, um, it could make sense to have a, a distinct sales force. The other thing is, I think since we visited at the time, these sales ladies, they were actually selling both through retail. It was the same sales force selling through retail and selling directly to people doing door to door. And that has been changed because this is really two different types of job between educating people and, and uh, restocking retailers. Um, to tell you a little bit more about this specific example, and how it can really help create demand. Uh, when Nutriza started back in 2007, uh, they were mostly using this door-to-door -door network and also selling through that they what they call hotel in, which are basically baby restaurants where you can go with your baby and buy the porridge they need and you'll get some uh, education as well. I mean, uh, information about what are good uh, practices for taking care of your baby, etc. cetera. Uh, and so these two channels, which were really proximity channels, were the 100% of the sales back in 2007. Thanks to this uh, channel, uh, they managed to raise a 90% awareness of the brand with the kids in the streets uh, screaming, Kobaina, which is the name of the flower, <laughs> uh, when, the, when the sales lady arrived to sell the, the porridge because they like it. Uh, so obviously that creates very quickly awareness in the neighborhood. Uh, and 57% of monthly penetration in the areas around these baby restaurants. Um, and uh, that allowed them then to take the product to retail. So instead of having that step that I mentioned earlier of using mass media to create a, the minimum awareness of the product that allows retailers to take the products, they strictly used proximity marketing to create that same awareness. And it worked. Retail then accepted to take on the product because they had heard about it in the neighborhood. 
Um, and what basically happened is that back in 2013, you can see that retail was 46% of the sales. And today, Clemence told me just before the call of the webinar um, that it's actually up to 69% uh, yeah. today. Um, yeah. So it's, it's kept growing. Um, and the door-to-door -door networks really help as a promotion channel. But now more and more people actually just go to retail to buy because they know of the benefits of the product. So what we've just discussed happened in urban area, but can a door-to-door -door sales force like this one work elsewhere? What you can see here um, is basically how much one salesperson as a full-time equivalent, so one full-time salesperson manages to sell in thousands of dollars per year in different uh, cases. So we've looked at whether these uh, salespeople were selling what, just one category of products, so just health product, or a portfolio, a multi-category bag of products. And we've looked at whether they were working in rural areas and urban area, uh, or urban areas. Uh, and this is not just based on the seven cases from the study, but on the 20 plus micro distribution cases we had looked at before. And you can see that this, the only uh, area where you can reach sales of over 6,000 dollars per year per salesperson, so that's about $500 worth of merchandise per month, um, is actually in urban areas if you're selling mono category or just one category of product. Because otherwise, if, you, if you're in a rural area, the issue is you just don't have enough clients in a small enough area to sell enough of your products. And that's even worse if you're trying to sell multi-category of products because then especially for these products that we're talking about that need a lot of education. If you try to explain five products instead of just one, you lose a lot of time with one client to probably not make any sale. In addition to that, you're probably not as good at as it, you were probably not as good at explaining one type of product as the others. So you won't be a great salesperson for five products. You might be a great salesperson for one, but you still have to talk about the four others. Um, so that explains why we've seen very low performances of multi-category Salesforce and or, and or of rural area direct door-to-door -door Salesforce for fast-moving consumer goods. It's a different story for durable goods, but if you want to know more about this, I invite you to watch the rerun of the webinars we did back this summer. Anyway, now we'll see whether you have followed or not. Um, so what should you do if you want to sell your nutritious foods? Um, if you're in urban areas, the first question is, is your brand already known? If it's not, then probably your smartest move in terms of promotion and distribution is to create a direct door-to-door -door sales force that will not just bring your product to clients, but allow them to try it, to do their first try. And will also, if possible, be convenient. Because in the case of Nutrizaz or Nutrifaso, which is another program supported by the GRET, where the sales lady also do door to door, um, mothers don't buy the porridge just because they think it's good for their child. It also happens to come at the exact right time where they need to feed their children in the morning and it's already warm and it's the right quantity and they don't need to think about preparing a special food for their children when they don't have the time to do so. So that convenience aspect is also a great selling point. Now, if you are in a more mature market, then the question is, does your value proposition require that additional service? If you want to be the provider of warm porridge at breakfast time, then you do need that sales network, even if everybody knows about that porridge already. So it makes sense to continue having that door-to-door -door sales force, probably selling at a little premium compared to the price of your product in retail, because you're offering additional value and convenience. Um, if you don't actually need that additional service, then you can just sell via proximity, networks, uh, whichever they are in your areas. Now, if you're in rural areas, it's a different story. The first question is, do you have retailers or pharmacies? Uh, sorry, is there an existing trusted door-to-door -door network you can leverage? It's rarely the case, but if it is, go for it, because their costs are already covered by others, and you can piggyback on it. Um, so that's the case of BRAC that we discussed earlier. Um, if, uh, if not, if you don't have that network, the question then is, do you have other ways of selling your product through retailers or pharmacies? If so, you can try to sell through these channels. You will probably need a, a rotating marketing teams to go and do um, big shows and like, you know, explain your product, et cetera, because you still need that awareness. Um, if you don't have these small shops, um, then basically, and unfortunately, 
we haven't seen any company succeeding in selling new complicated nutritious foods in these areas sustainably. It's a different story if we're talking about non-nutritious foods, shows, shampoo, soap, things people already know. But for new products, good products that need education and awareness, uh, a direct sales force, as we've seen, just won't manage to be sustainable on its own. I'll continue. So now we'll see whether you followed the previous slides, <laughs> the last poll of this discussion. The average salesperson of a performing direct sales force of nutritious products in a developing country can sell how much per year? First answer, $2,000 worth of product for one salesperson in one year, or around $10,000 worth of products, or around $20,000 worth of products. Well, so again, the average salesperson of a performing, so a good sales force, you've really managed to bring your sales force to a good level. How many, much will that person sell? $2,000 worth of product per year, $10,000 worth of product per year, or 20,000? Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Yeah, people are shy voting here. <laughs> $2,000 worth of product per year, say the majority. Well, actually, you haven't really followed what came before then um, because a good sales force, the well-performing sales force, um, where, as we're going to see in this lesson about how do you optimize their productivity, manages to sell $18,000 worth of product per year up to so the $2,000 ones, one salesperson selling $2,000 of product, that's not good because, I mean, it's, how can I say this? The, the efforts companies are making are really should, should be encouraged, et cetera. But with $2,000 sales per salesperson per year, there's no way you're going to cover the cost it entails to sell these products. So a good performing sales force is basically between ten and twenty thousand dollars per salesperson per year if you want to ever be self-sustainable. However, as you can see, there is a wide range of performance, both for companies that sell through door-to-door -door or for companies that sell through salesperson that sell to retail, which then goes to seven thousand dollars worth of product to, and I don't see the side on my screen, but I think it's around thirty thousand if I remember correctly. Um, so, how do we explain this range? Um, the other type of range we see is that even within the same sales force, you can also have a vast disparity of amount of sales. On this graph we represented for a direct sales force, uh, it's a real example, um, the spread between the least productive of the sales force, who are selling about 0.1% of, of the amount of, of, of the total sales of that sales force, to the most performing ones, which were selling over 6% of the total sales. And thinking if we, if we just manage to bring the entire sales force to sell at the average of the 30% of the 30 best salespeople. So we're just trying to bring the average to the average of the 30% best salespeople. Just by this, so just by replicating your best salespeople within your sales force, you manage to increase sales by 70%. So nearly doubling your sales just because you've made your salespeople better. Um, I think, Marty, you had an example on this. Yeah, the, um, you mentioned already, and for the ones that were um, on, the, on the webinar last week, I mentioned the example of Brak in Bangladesh, um, and, and you mentioned it as well, where over 40,000, 45,000 um, community health workers that Brak employs, which is actually only half of their total sales force, these women are selling micronutrient powders. And, and Gain has been working over the past three years with them. And we've um, set up a monthly monitoring system that allows us to know exactly what are the sales um, every month per sales lady. And, well, they're actually not called sales ladies, but um, um, looking at that, we can, look in, we can look at the low performers, the high performers, and we're actually splitting in four categories. Um, and we are actually also looking at what is different? Why are the, the low performers performing low? What can we do to, to improve it? And, and due to this analysis, 
um, well, we have actually started giving trainings, not only on the counseling, on nutrition and micronutrient powders, but actually also on the promotion techniques or sales techniques, if you wish, um, which wasn't done before. Um, we've been looking at um, really improving and getting the lower quartiles up. And of course, in the end, there are certain women that may not be motivated or have other kinds of reasons why they're low performers and they may drop out in the end. But it is definitely possible to move them up. Now, maybe not all to the best quarter, but it's definitely possible if you're really looking at your data and analyzing who is performing well or not, that you can, with subsequent interventions, improve the performance. It's really interesting. Excuse me, interrupting. Um, Lucia, might involve going back to the previous slide. We're getting lots of questions on what really makes a difference here. And Marty, you've just described lots of Salesforce training, implementation, monitoring, management issues that make a difference. But people are also asking um, whether these are companies that are already at scale or are at the, the smaller end and how much difference that makes, whether they're the large companies with a known brand, how much difference that makes, whether they're the Salesforce is alongside um, educational work and how much difference that makes so i don't know if there's anything more you can add on the drivers on and differences without so, obviously giving away i think there's really two factors it might it might sound obvious what i'm saying but there's the strategy and the execution of that strategy the strategy is what type of products you decide to sell in which environment it's the aspect of rural versus urban it's what i was describing here if you're selling if your salespeople are tasked with multi-category products and are selling in rural areas and or are selling in rural areas, it's going to be tricky to make it work. Just because, as, as I said earlier, too few clients, too many products splitting the sales speech. And, and these are your, in, in general, you're taking local people because they have the trust of other people, which is true, but it's going to be tricky to have them explain five products and and what we've seen I'm not saying this of ide out of ideology because because that's what we've seen in the field it just doesn't work well <laughs> much less well than if you have an urban sales force selling one type of product not just one product but one type of product that you can explain together um, so that's in terms of strategy and then there's the execution which is what Marty was just selling that saying sorry Basically, within the same sales force, some people sell much worse in spite of the fact that they're selling the same product in the same condition. Some people sell much better. And this is really where the tricks of how do you make the pitch, um, I, basically all the sales training might come into play. Um, how, and then you also have all the how do you incentivize that sales force? Are they incentivized with a bonus or not? And then there are a lot of little tricks you can play on um, to help bring your sales force to a good level. And that's more the execution part. So it's a mix of these two things that explain why some of the companies we looked at were performing much better than others, basically. So Lucy, are you saying that brand, the, the knownness of the company, perhaps the size of the company, isn't a big influence on that, those differences? Uh, not necessarily, no. Some of the, I mean... We looked at the companies that were considered the best in the space of micro distribution. Some of them, uh, I mean, in the low performers, you also have some that had thousands of salespeople. Okay. And in the good performers, you had also some that were at, much lo at a much lower scale. Actually, the, the best performers were often at a much lower scale because they had chosen to figure out what should be the right strategy and really make sure that this was sustainable before going big. Right. Um, yeah. Thanks. I think we'll come back to this in the discussion because lots of the chat is about the difference SMEs. I completely. don't see the chat. That's probably no, that's fine. <laughs> you don't need to while you're presenting. We'll come back. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to run quickly through the last slides, which are a few tricks, a few of these tricks of execution I was mentioning that can really help uh, make you sell, sell better. Um, one thing is mapping the routes followed by your sales force and really making sure they get the most out of their territory uh, is one thing. So there are three examples of how you can do this. Um, the first example here you can see is from Semilla, which is a Danone-led program in Mexico that sells uh, yogurts uh, in relatively poor areas of Mexico City. Uh, and they have sales ladies that go door to door with their little uh, 
cart of products. Uh, and before they install a depot, so the central point where they're going to sell from, they map out the area to really make sure they know where the key areas of meeting are, uh, whether there are enough houses and enough potential clients for their sales force, et cetera. And that's based on this analysis that they decide where to start selling. Uh, BRAC similarly makes sure that every area served by one of their community health workers has at least 200 potential households in their area to be sure that she'll be able to have enough uh, of an income from her sales. Um, then you can also, once you've done that, assign routes to the sales force. So help them plan their, uh, their route to make sure they make the most out of the potential. Uh, so PKL, for example, in Côte d'Ivoire, which we've already mentioned, they have specific routes for their sale agent. They know where they have to go every day. Milkuat in Indonesia, they have each week sales objectives for their sales force, which sell through shops and through schools. And every salesperson knows how many shops, how many schools they're supposed to see in their territory. And finally, you can work on monitoring. You can also monitor sales, the Salesforce activities. You can see here the Salesforce monitoring system of BRAC. You can see that it used to be done very completely by hand. They're now switching to an IT system. Um, but it's always been, they've always monitored super closely what they're doing, and it's one of their key for success. Um, and in the case of selling products, it's also key because it helps avoid stockouts. Um, other th one other thing you can do, and that's done more and more, is trying to leverage ICT as much as possible. Uh, three examples there from Living Goods, which you might know, they're a community health worker organization in Uganda and Kenya. Um, and so they've set up, they were really pioneers in this, uh, a complete uh, CRM, so customer relationship management and monitoring system, uh, basically following each of their sales lady, each of their sales force, um, and also keeping track of their clients. They had the phone number of all of their clients to be able to send them reminders or to take their medicines uh, or advice if they're a pregnant woman, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, an example from Milkuat in Indonesia, um, their sales managers used Blackberry groups to share best practices, send pictures of what they had done, and get feedback from the field as well. And finally, Nutrizaza, um, they had a punctual monitoring system, if one can say, through mobile money, because their animatrices were, are sending um, their cash, the cash they collect through mobile money. So that basically helped their manager know how much they've sold because the money comes back um, very quickly uh, through this system. So anything you can do to monitor your sales force and be able to identify who are the good ones, who are the less good ones in real time and help them progress in real time uh, is really key. Also in terms of interacting with your clients and having a good uh, yeah, client management relation, uh, relationship management system um, really also helps make your clients compliant, et cetera. Um, finally, sorry, uh, one thing that is key for direct sales force is trying to instill a strong sense of purpose and comradeship in the job because it's a hard job going knocking on doors and getting mostly no's. It's difficult. Uh, so one example from Semia in Mexico, uh, their sales ladies had meeting every day before and after they went on their individual route to brief and debrief the day and do some community activities. They sing together. They really, I mean, they had a really great way of making all of them feel unique and empowered and unique, but with the group at the same time. Another example is Natura, uh, which you might know. It's um, a cosmetic brand uh, in Brazil. Uh, and Brazil is their biggest country. They have over 1 million beauty consultants over there. The beauty consultants being the sales lady of the organization going, uh, selling door to door. Um, their consultants uh, really embody the natural value and, and play a role of coach for their clients as well in terms of beauty, etc. cetera. Um, so they really play on this relationship, making them feel they're consultants. They're not just saleswomen. Um, and they have relationship managers with whom... Um, who manage them. And as you can see from this quote here, after, and I don't see the side on my slide, there I go. Uh, after my monthly consultant meetings, I never leave before hugging each 50 of them. Um, so basically the relationship managers really hold their team close um, and play this role of role model. Uh, and that really has enabled Natura to keep this, uh, this 1.2 billion consultant. I should mention they fire those who don't perform for three months in a row. So the 1.2 million are actually good salespeople. Um, so this community sense is really something that also works and is important. Uh, I think we're getting to the end of this presentation. So uh, 
We've only covered three of the four lessons of the distribution and sustainability. I invite you to go to our report online if you want to see the last one or if you want more details on this one because we still didn't cover everything. And now I'll just leave the floor to questions. Thank you so much, Lucy. And uh, we have already interrupted you with some questions. Uh, and we're going to take the whole question about cash flow and financing because many people have raised that. And then uh, on the hour, we will ask the panelists to stay on for another 10 minutes for those of you that want to stay to deal with some of the other questions. I know some people will have to leave on the hour. Um, uh, HP asked early on in this, um, how do you deploy a sales force if your cash flow is irregular, if you're an SME in this nutrition? And other people have asked about how high are the upfront costs and how much upfront financing do you need? And how long does it take to scale, particularly with a sales force? And does it take longer than grant money will last for? There's not enough finance. So lots of questions about financing, particularly with a sales force strategy. Could you comment on that? Sure. Uh, one thing I'd like to go back on and insist on is that the successful examples in, the, in this presentation and the ones with the biggest sales figure weren't the biggest ones. And if you want to succeed, don't scale fast because that won't work. I, it's hard to hear, but you have to get a stable model and sell financing uh, salespeople who sell enough to sustain their own costs and to sustain the cost of the organization before you scale. Because it's much more difficult to tweak a model with 200 or even 2,000 salespeople than to tweak one with eight salespeople. So really, my advice for this is get it right small before scaling up. Don't think I'll scale up and, you know, because I have donor money and or because I have donors telling me they won't fund me and that I'm talking to the donors in the room. Even I don't want to get smashed in the face, but I might, but I'd rather say what I think here. <laughs> so basically, if if you're a donor here and you want to fund an organization that will succeed, don't ask them to scale too fast. Ask them to get the model right and fund them to get the model right before scaling up. Um, that's what I think in terms. So I, I, well, that kind of answers the question about how do you get the, uh, do you have the cash flow? Yes, you should, because at the beginning, at least you shouldn't, you shouldn't have too many salespeople. You should have, a small number, get the model right, and then scale. And is grant money going to last me enough? If you're a small team, yes, it should last you enough because you won't need that much money to run your pilots. You do need grant money to run the pilots. Don't get me wrong on this. But just get the pilots right before scaling up and not the other way around. Do you have any comment how long it takes to get to the point where you can start scaling? Uh, it really depends on the pilot cycle, but... Uh, uh, maybe a couple of years to get, well, it depends where you start counting from where you start from. If you already have a, a, the right product, a product that's adapted to the local taste and local habits, etc., and you just talk about the distribution and marketing aspect of things, I'll, I'd, I'd say a couple of years, maybe two years. But yeah, then, maybe can I, oh, excuse me. Go ahead, please. No, I, I, I think what we um, looks at and, and part of the examples that GAIN has are in the history report and then we have a, a couple of other examples. The projects that we've been doing over the past years and they are focusing on complementary feeding, not any nutritious food, but really foods for infants. Um, we saw that it's just almost not possible to get a, to a break even point where your investments are finally giving a return on investment and you start making profits within, let's say, six to eight years. And that compared to what you're looking at, fast moving consumer goods or bigger companies, then they're more looking at the three to four years. So it's really much more important. But don't forget that, that um, we are also looking at immature markets. Um, you know, it's, it's very different. The, you can't really easily compare those figures, but it is a long time. It mm -hmm. is. And therefore, um, there is a need for cross subsidizing um, because you need, as a company, you need your cash, cash flow to continue investing and keeping it up. Um, so there may be a need for cross subsidizing with some other um, product portfolio. I'm just going to interrupt because we're at our hour. We are going to come back to questions of what counts as scale and what so much upfront costs are. 
uh, the significance of the name of education there are some specific questions we'll come back to and I think there might be more we might need to put into a little Q&A on the webinar page if the panelists are up for that because we can't address some of the very specific ones I know some people have to leave but we're going to carry on for 10 minutes uh, and further information will be on the webinar page if everybody's happy with that panelists sure. okay great just still on this question of costs um, and Clemence, I don't know if this is a question for you to answer. Someone's asking, well, how much are the upfront costs? Do you have any sense of how much we're talking about for setting up a animatrice or a Salesforce distribution network? No, not directly. I should say that um, the good thing is that we could e exchange on the Q&A with NutriZaza directly. We could maybe give much more information about the costs. Um, what I know is uh, about the business model of Nutrizaza that has been uh, worked on um, five years, six to six years, and uh, to because I see some uh, question inside the inside the chat as well on this point. So I think there are a lot of questions that we can answer on this upfront cost, but right now I don't get the answer directly from this. I'm sorry. Okay, thanks. And Lucy, we have another question. What counts as scale? The ones that are operating. Uh, you said there's obviously sales per sales force and that's different from the company itself operating at scale but when we are talking about operating at scale what scale are we talking about oh, that's a good question um, the companies we looked at in the report which were the best ones in this category of selling complementary foods at the time we looked at them were selling about 10,000 meals per day which is already quite a lot uh, in this space but they were still very small companies. Um, yeah, they were still very small companies with like, not that many, the sales force was in the tens of people, not the hundreds. Um, so uh, this is small scale. Uh, scale would be when you can really, when you've really started selling to the entire country. So we're not talking 10,000, whichever country you're talking about, it should be in millions and not in, in well, let's say hundreds of thousands, so 10 times bigger. Um, so that you reach a significant proportion of the, well, again, here talking about the complementary food market, so specifically for the six to 24 months of age children, uh, you want to get to a significant market share. So 20% of the children between that age group, um, um, I'd say. Thank you. A couple of high level questions. People are taking from this a slightly depressing. It's really hard for the smaller companies to make it those that don't have established brand. And it's really hard for rural areas to make it, which is where the most vulnerable and needy people who need the products are. Do you want to just comment on this, <laughs> this takeaway? Um, on the first aspect, it's really hard for small companies. So those that are trying to sell complementary foods for infants, yes, as Marty said, I mean, this is a super tricky market. When I was mentioning two years for pilot, it's for easier products to sell. Uh, complementary foods does take longer. It's so specific. It, it has to fit so well into local habits and it's such a complicated space um, at every level. Um, so yes, if you're into infant food for these young children, um, it, they are, it, yes, uh, that's, it's, it's tricky. Uh, it's very tricky. But that's really where, as Marty mentioned about the marketing cost, that's where alliances with the public sector to lower this cost of awareness raising, et cetera, should be most possible. Um, that's where donor money is needed. And same to pilot and to get the models right because it takes time and it's tricky and, and it's, it's a really tricky market. Um, same thing about rural areas. Um, if you, that's true, they're the most vulnerable, et cetera. Um, the approaches for these areas that can work are a subsidized approach. It's not that there's no approach that can work, it's subsidized approach, at least at the beginning, um, until basically until the products are known enough, etc. So our recommendation for a strategy is if you're a company wanting to sell nutritious infant food, start in, rural, in urban areas where you have a chance of being self-sustainable uh, in alliance with, with donors uh, and or with the public sector to finance the awareness raising cost, etc. And once your product is known in, in urban areas, it will start to get known in, in rural areas and it will become possible to sell in these areas because part of the education, et cetera, hopefully will have percolated a bit. 
And then th those rural areas, you can maybe finance through the cash you're earning in urban areas or again through donors. Uh, that's kind of our ideal scenari scenario, even if it's not rosy <laughs> all the way. Um, I don't know, Marty if, or Clemos, if you want to add something to that. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, it's not because it's difficult that it can't be done. I mean, it's not, let's say, if it would have been a big business opportunity, you know, the big businesses would have been in there already. And so, um, and so what I see is that there is an opportunity for smaller businesses to get that space, but you have to not be too ambitious and you have to be really smart on how you're doing it and, and taking into account the points you mentioned, um, Lucy. But the partnership part is really important. And the partnership part, I mentioned it when I was typing on the chat, is it is really also about um, finding an entry point to an institutional market from producing to such a quality that you may be able to sell to either government or to an NGO that is distributing food for free for certain most vulnerable groups. If you have that part of a market, it's easier, you, you sell bulk, you don't have to do marketing for it, and you can reinvest that, let's say, slightly higher profit into marketing for your retail. So I think it's the trying in the beginning, um, the mix between um, access to um, both retail and an institutional market. Now, it's not that institutional markets are easy to get in, but if you've got really good quality of product, um, and, um, and, and you're having a partnership, I mean, that's the thing, having a partnership with a public sector organization will help you there. I think we've heard some realism, but I do feel we've also had a lot of very practical tips from the experience we've heard on this call. So I hope people don't go away too depressed because I think Lucy said there are lots of things you can do to increase effectiveness, productivity, and therefore impact without being a huge organization or having already huge penetration of the market. So um, I want to thank you for the realism, but also um, from all three of you, some very practical ways forward. Um, I think the, the slides will be up online and it's really, there's a, a lot of specific details in there of what works. So I hope those of you and um, all the wonderful questions you've put in, I can see people are doing all kinds of interesting things. Uh, I hope there's something in there that will help each organization to make their um, initiative more productive. We are going to ask, the, we'll convert the questions into a document and try and get a bit more um, Q&A and some of the answers to more of the questions that you've asked. Because there's a, there's a lot, more than we've ever had on any, any webinar before, I think. So um, obviously a very successful webinar. Thank you for the panelists and thank you very much for all of the participants. Give us a day or two. Well, the webinar itself will be up very, very quickly. The slides will be up there immediately and more Q&A will be up there as soon as we can get it there. Um, please do sign up for the Practitioner Hub and then you will get our next uh, newsletter on partnerships between donors and businesses, which is obviously relevant. And the next one on consumer insight. And uh, join us again for another webinar. If you would like to do one, let us know. All the best and thank you very much indeed to everybody. Thank you very much, Caroline. Thank, Thank you. you.